Rachel and Aaron and the girls are going to sing here in just a moment. If y'all want to make your way up, uh, Aaron pastors the Crossroads Baptist Church in Mobile, Alabama. Been there now for coming up on 10 years, I think they said. And uh, he and Rachel have been married for 19 years now. And uh, they just had an anniversary back in earlier this month. The 17th, I didn't quite remember the date, but the 17th of December. Uh, Rachel has been a school teacher and she homeschools the kids now. I think she heads up their homeschool co-op out of their church. And, uh, and these two, uh, Chloe is a 17-year-old senior in high school. And so life is fixing to change. And uh, Abigail, you a freshman or a junior? She's a sophomore. <laughs> Freshman or junior. I wouldn't miss that one right in the middle, would I? And uh, so anyway, we know life's fixing to change because Chloe is be graduating from school and going off to college here before long. So they've been with us all week. We've really enjoyed it. And I'm sure you're going to enjoy this song. Against the raging tide of those who bring 
my grandkids won't appreciate that as much as somebody like me can appreciate that. My grandkids have Christian parents and they have Christian grandparents and uh, one side of the great grandparents. And so, you know, as I look at them, my <coughs> caution would be you can take that for granted. And, and I would like to be one who encourages you don't ever take for granted. And then I stand, I sit here and I'm looking. And I'm saying, that's my daughter. That's my daughter. That's our daughter. <laughs> <laughs> but but by, when I say it like that, I mean, and my wife, she comes from a Christian family with Christian parents and Christian grandparents. I didn't come from that. And so here with a, I won't tell you how old, daughter. You can kind of add it up. You can figure it out, you know. A 41. Yeah. A 41 year old daughter, <coughs> teenage children, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Y'all know in my testimony where I come from? For me to sit here and be able to listen to my daughter and her husband and, her ch and their children sing, uh, I mean, it's more than just about the song, although I appreciated the song a great deal. It's just. My kids are serving the Lord. My grandkids are learning to serve the Lord. And that's a big deal for me. And praise the Lord for it. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. Praise the Lord for it. Appreciate it. Good song. Great song. And very well done. Thank you very much. They were practicing earlier, and uh, Freddie said, uh, we just need to keep them here all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we'll see. Yeah. But uh, you pray for them and their ministry. God continue to work in their lives. Uh, you've gotten to know, like Justice, you got to know recently because he just spent the last summer. And then, uh, of course, each of the kids have spent summers with us. And we've enjoyed that. And like I said, we know things are fixing to change with their family. And, uh, uh, and with Bo's family, too, because right on the heels of Chloe graduating, is. Hunter and Caleb graduating, and it's just going to go right on down the line there. And so, uh, continue to be prayerful. <coughs> Let's go back to Philippians chapter 3 for just a minute. And uh, I'm going to take a couple of verses there. And we've already hit them a little bit, but I'm going to take them a little different direction. It's just going to be a starting place. Uh, I've been teaching now through Philippians, and we've been doing this series also on the work of the Holy Spirit and the dispensation of the grace. And, uh, but uh, today I'm going to give a New Year's challenge. Uh, uh, we're going to do a New Year's, uh, a reminder and challenge for the new year. And it's appropriate and fitting for us to do so, I think. And so uh, that's kind of the direction we're going to go in the next little while that we have available to us. I hope it will be a help to us. Uh, <clears throat> You know, when preachers preach, they preach not only to their listeners, but they preach to themselves first. And, uh, and that's just the way it works. If it doesn't work that way, it should. And, uh, and so that's kind of where we are. But we were there this morning, Philippians chapter 3, and we read verse 13 and 14. And like I say, I'm going to kind of lift it out of its context and make an application, and we'll carry on with what we have to say today. But Paul said there in Philippians 3, 13 and 14, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So we want to make an application for that as we leave 2018 and we get ready to enter into 2019. Uh, make an application of that principle, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before. Uh, uh, we look back on a year, and I guess we all do. Uh, if, uh, I would think we do. We get reflective about a year. Uh, you know, certain times of life, certain uh, anniversaries, or certain periods <coughs> of time in life where we get reflective. And I guess we all do when the new year changes. 
again, I heard a preacher on the radio talking about he didn't like to talk about New Year's resolutions. He liked to talk about New Year's commitments. I'm not real sure there's a difference. Uh, if I'm resolved for something or I make a commitment to something, uh, it's six in one hand, half a dozen the other. It's just a matter of the words we choose to use. And so whether you want to call it New Year's resolutions or whether you want to call it a New Year's commitment or uh, whatever it is, uh, I hope that you also are reflective about the outgoing year and then the incoming year. As I go through and do like I do and do my word chases, I look up the word new as it relates to things being new. And Paul talks to us about several things, and I'm going to rush through some things and then get to some practical things. But Paul talks about that we are raised to walk in newness of life in Romans chapter 6, verse 4. And so we know when we trust Christ as our Savior, as we said, we are buried with Him, we died with Him, we're buried with Him, we're raised with Him, and we're raised to walk in newness of life. When we come to saving faith in Christ, we come out of Adam and we come to the end of Christ, and that is when new life begins. We're raised to walk in newness of life. He goes on in Romans chapter 7 and verse 6, and he talks about that we serve in newness of spirit. And so we serve not out of a sense of duty, not out of a sense of law, not out of a sense of trying to be right with God, but we serve in newness of spirit. We serve because we are right, not in order to get right. And that's a big difference. That's the difference between law and grace. We, we serve because we get to, not because we have to. Have you ever been doing things on a Saturday night and the words come out of your mouth? We can't be too late. We've got to get up early because we've got to go to church on Sunday morning. I've got to go. No, we get to go. Don't have to go. You can stay home. We get to go. Kids get busy in life and they have activities and things they want to do. And you mean we have to go to church today? No, you get to go to church today. <laughs> Sun's shining brightly and we haven't ridden for a month and we say, <laughs> you know, I'd a whole lot rather go ride my horse today. Do I have to go to church? No, you don't have to. But you get to. And whatever it is that drag, you know, it will entice you as your life. We serve in newness of spirit and not the oldness of the letter. We serve because we want to and not because we have to. <laughs> Paul goes on and tells us in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, we're to purge out the old leaven and be a new lump. And so we're constantly examining our life and, and purging out the old that we might be a new lump. He tells us that we are new creatures in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and Galatians 6, 15, that we are a new creature. And that's an important concept for us to understand. Uh, it's not a revival of an old creature. It's, it's, old, it's, it's in Adam we die, but in Christ we're made alive, and in Christ we are a new creature in Christ. It's not a reformed old man. It's a completely new man. We're new creatures in Christ. And that's why Paul then talks about putting on the new man. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, Colossians 3, 10. He talks about putting on the new man. So all those are new things that, we're that we I, I want to remind us about. We walk in newness of life. We serve in newness of spirit. We are to purge out the old lump and be a new lump. We are new creatures in Christ, and we are to put on the new man. So those are the reminders. And we can wrap it up right there and, explain, you know, kind of elaborate on those and, and probably have done fine and, and all of us be encouraged. But I want to take the thing and take it a step farther and, and just kind of give some practical things <coughs> as we talk about the new year. Uh, give Freddie a title. I try to give him a title for the messages now so he can use them on the YouTube channel. And so to this morning, it's the, the reminders and challenges of this new and coming year. So now we talk about the challenges. The very first thing that I want to talk about for just a moment, and that's the question, are you saved? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there was a time and a place when you trusted Christ as your own personal Savior? I'm not talking about was there a time that you decided to start going to church? 
I'm not talking about was there a time you decided to start living better. I'm not talking about was there a time that you decided to put away some old things and start picking up some new things and, you know, making changes in your life. All those things are fine and good, are they not? But none of those things get us to heaven. You can add whatever new thing. You can, you can change your life. You can quit doing the don'ts and start doing the do's and all those things and still die and go to hell without Christ. And so the first question, the most important question, and, and you know, I look around the room and, and, and I've heard testimonies and so on, but, but I don't want to make an assumption on anyone's part. I, you've heard me tell the story many times. My wife and I were married several years, had both of our children, and had, were in the ministry. And she realized one evening uh, after a friend of ours had preached a message in the ministries, she realized that she had done a lot of things religiously, but she had never trusted Christ as her Savior. And she trusted Christ when she realized that. Our daughter was 17, 18 years old. 17. Were you in senior in high school? Senior in high school. And again, you know, in the ministry, working with us there in the youth rescue ministries. And she came out of her loft bedroom and came down to our room one night and said, Mom and Dad, I have never been saved. I need to be saved. And though she was a good girl and lived clean and did the things she was supposed to do and was busy in the work of the ministry that we were doing there, she, she realized, I've never trusted Christ. I've done a lot of religious things, but I've never trusted Christ. And a lot of would give the similar kind of testimonies. And so when I know in my own family, with my own wife, and my own daughter, that I have no idea who in this room may or may not have just done religious things and never trusted Christ. And so when we start thinking about leaving the old and walking into the new, I can't think of any more wonderful thing for an individual to do is to know for sure that they are saved by the grace of God. Amen. Well, Sam, how does that happen? You don't give invitations here. I've never walked an aisle here. I've never had an opportunity to do that. We don't do that here. But what do we do? We tell you that we're all sinners that can't save ourselves. And so you examine your heart. You say, yep. I realize I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. And then we tell you that God committed His love toward us and that while we're yet sinners... <laughs> Christ died on that cross for our sins. Romans 4 tells us He was delivered for our offenses. Delivered to the cross to shed His blood for our sins. He took our sins upon Himself. He took your sins upon Himself. Christ died for your sins. Past, present, and future. Christ died for your sins. And He was buried, left those sins in hell, and rose up that third day victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And by that resurrection, when we come to trust what He's accomplished, then we are justified by the work of Christ. So right there where you are, anytime, any place, even as I'm talking right now, you acknowledge in your heart and mind, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. And I've trusted religion. I've trusted doing better. And I've trusted straightening up. And I've trusted going to church. And I've trusted this, that, and the other. But I've never trusted Christ. Today, I'm trusting Jesus Christ. Dear God, I know the only way I'm ever going to get to heaven is because of what Jesus did. And I'm trusting Him to take me to heaven. Folks, that's how you get saved. Plain and simple. Doesn't require anything else. You mean I don't have to run the aisle? I don't have to break down and cry? I don't have to bawl and squall? I don't have to list and name all of my sins? No, all you got to hey, I'm sure. Can't save myself. And I'm going to trust Christ because the Word of God tells me plainly that my salvation is in the Word of Christ and not in anything that I do. Folks, you can be saved today. So that's the first thing. Are you saved? Do you know for sure that you've trusted Christ as your Savior? Well, you know, when I was a child, I went to youth camp and I did this or, or you know, whatever. And you go back to all these things. Yeah, but have you ever trusted Christ? Well, I know I prayed a prayer. Yeah, but have you ever trusted Christ? Well, I know that after I had this religious experience that I started acting better and doing better, at least, you know, some better. But have you ever trusted Christ? See, there's the question, right? 
How many times have I said, and I guess I probably say it several times a month, uh, if I don't end up saying it every Sunday, I know I'm going to heaven because, and you fill in the blank. I know I'm going, it's not I hope I'm going to heaven, it's not I'm trying to go to heaven, I know I'm going to heaven because, fill in the blank. And if you fill in that blank with anything other than, I know I'm going to heaven because I'm trusting what Jesus did to get me there. If you fill in that blank with anything else, you could very well and are most likely lost. I know I'm going to heaven, not because of what I've done, or ever could do, but I know I'm going to heaven because of what Jesus did for me, and I'm trusting Him and Him alone to take me to heaven. What a wonderful way to end one year and enter into a new. Yes. To trust Christ. So that's the first question. Are you saved? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt? And if you've trusted Christ alone as your personal Savior, then you can and should know because of the testimony of Scripture that you are saved and sealed and on your way to heaven. Because it's not about what you do, it's about what He did. And you're trusting Him. Because if your flesh is anything like my flesh, if I was trusting my flesh, I would have no hope. Right? And so I'm not trusting my flesh, I'm trusting what he did. And in his flesh, he bore my sins. And he took those to hell, and he rose up victorious. Trust Christ. Are you saved? That's the number one question. And then as we challenge believers... And if you sit right there today and you trust Christ today and you're saved today, then you're now a member of the body of Christ and just keep on walking right through here with us, right? And so we're just going to take it the next step. First question, are you saved? Next one is, is the challenge to get in our Bibles. How, how many times and how often do I preach the importance of us getting in our Bibles? There is no understanding of God, of what He's doing, of who He is, apart from getting in our Bibles. They sang the song, The Word Shall Stand. It stands. Well, if it stands on the bookshelf, or it stands on the desk, or if it stands in the back of the car, or if it stands in the church pew to save your place for the next time you come to church, if it stands wherever you lay it at the end of this service today, doesn't do you a whole lot good. The Word of God stands, it stands, and it works when we put it into our heart, we put it into our mind, and we read it, and we make it a part of who we are. And I say that from the youngest to the oldest. Everybody in this room can read. Some can read better than others. Some like to read more than others. Freddie was sharing with me this morning that uh, he and uh, Deborah have found a, a little gizmo. You can get it on at Amazon, or you can get it at Walmart. He said the best time to go was Wednesday when they stock their shelves because they sell them out pretty quickly. I hadn't heard about it. I guess I never paid attention to it. It's a little thing. It's called a Wonder Bible. It costs about 40 bucks. And it's got a long life battery and you can recharge it and you can type in what you want to listen to and you can put it in the car or you can take it to work or you can carry it around with you wherever you are and it'll read to you. Because I'm very much aware that there's folks in this room. Well, Sam, I... I'm just not much of a reader. <laughs> but you get the Word of God in you. And when I say some, some are not much of a reader because they just don't, you know, discipline themselves to do it or they don't care to do it, others have a real struggle to read. It's, it's work to read. Some of us can't sit still long enough. Some of us can't sit still long enough. So if you put that thing, carry it with you, and then you got it. If I start talking about reading three chapters a day, there's people in this room that say, man, it'll take me an hour and a half to read three chapters. I don't, have, I don't want to sit and read three, you know, an hour and a half, try to read and understand three, three chapters. Are you kidding me? And so I'm very much aware of that. So, you, you know, you can preach it, but then you've got to make it practical. How am I to do it? However you can get it done, get the Word of God in you. Read it and get the Word of God in you. I can't emphasize that enough. There is no understanding of what God's doing apart from His Word. We have to read it. We have to know what it says. And then we have to rightly divide it. Freddie was saying, said they'll listen to something and they'll listen along. And, and, and sometimes, you know, you hear something different than what you read something. And that's 
So you, you can do both. You can read and you can listen. And he said, they'll, they'll be listening to something and they'll stop and they'll back it up and they'll read it and they'll read it. They'll listen to it again. Well, I had never heard that. Never thought about it that way. And they'll have a discussion. Man, what a wonderful thing. They do that while they're working together on the projects that they work. What a wonderful thing to do. And listen, us older folks can do it and the kids can do it. Ella can do it. Justice can do it. Asher and Chloe and Abby can do it. All of us can do that. We'll put that thing and take it with us. How much time do we spend riding down the road in our vehicles, back and forth to work and all the places we do? Find a way to get the Word of God in you. Just find a way. Well, same on, you know, uh, and we make excuses. Find a way. If it's important to you, guess what you'll do? You'll find a way. And so get that thing. Do you can get one of them things, put it in his truck, and you can listen while you drive from job to job. You can do that. One of the nice things about it is you don't need internet or radio waves to listen to it. Yeah, it's know? just self-contained little gizmo. Yeah. It's called a Wonder Bible. Costs forty bucks. And uh, I just suggested that because I thought, man, I'm glad you mentioned that. It fits right in. It's a wonderful tool because that's a practical thing a lot of people can use. I can use that. Put that thing in my van and listen to it. Wonderful thing. Good idea. King James Version. King James Version. <laughs> Amen. And so. So the, the reading of the Bible and then, of course, of studying the Bible. Paul, Paul of course, Paul told us 1 Timothy 4.13, give attendance to reading. Didn't he? Give attendance to reading. Get the Word of God in you. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, right to divide the Word of truth. So we read our Bible and we study our Bible. I, I can't overemphasize the, the importance of getting the Word of God and studying the Word of God on a practical way for yourself some way. Now some are going to be much more diggers than others. Some are going to be more casual than others. Again, you know, to whatever point we've already attained, wherever you are, <coughs> determine in 2019 I'm going to get more of the Word of God in me than I got in me in 2018. And if all the Word of God you're getting in you is what you get when you come and sit in here for two hours on a Sunday morning, I'm going to tell you that ain't enough. It's just not enough. So find a way to get the Word of God in you. <coughs> read your Bible. Study your Bible. That's the first challenge there. Are you saved? And then second, read your Bible and study your Bible. Another challenge. Uh, consider your ambassadorship. Now that's a big long word, isn't it? Ambassadorship. But we each and every one of us are ambassadors for Christ. If we are saved by the grace of God, sealed unto that day of redemption, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 16 through 21 tells us that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. We are citizens of our heavenly home, and we are here as God's representative on earth with the gospel of the grace of God committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. We're to be about telling others that God the Father hath made God the Son to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. That's not just the preacher's job. That's everybody's job. We are ambassadors. We're either good ambassadors or we're bad ambassadors. But we're all ambassadors. We're all God's representatives. If we are saved, we are the representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ here on this earth. And we are to represent Him well. We are to be equipped and we are to understand and we are to have a basic understanding for sure of the gospel and how to find that gospel in the Word of God and how to share that gospel with others. Be a good ambassador. And ambassadorship first and foremost and primarily has to do with the ministry of reconciliation which is getting out the gospel. Tell others about Jesus. From the youngest of us to the oldest of us, we can find a way to talk to others about Jesus. Look for opportunities. Find open doors. Seek open doors. Always be sensitive about. I'm an ambassador for Christ. I want to be. I want to. I want to know. For, I want to have the assurance that I'm saved and on my way to heaven. I want to spend more time in my Bible this year and get more of the Word of God in me this year. I want to study my Bible more this year, and I want to be a more faithful ambassador, sharing the gospel of the grace of God, being about the ministry of reconciliation in the new coming year. Be busy about that. And it's not about, uh, you, you know, it's, it's, it's not about how many you win, it's about how many you tell. 
Does that make sense? It's just about putting out the word, planting the seed. It's not my job to, to count the numbers of how many responded. It's just my job to keep putting it out. And guess what? That's your job too. But Brother Sam, I, what if nobody ever responds? Just keep planting the seed. You don't know whether they did or didn't. Right? Just keep planting the seed. Just be a good ambassador. If you're looking for uh, if you're looking for results and you're motivated by results, you're liable to get real discouraged. Just keep being faithful. Just realize I'm an ambassador. I represent my heavenly citizenship and I have a ministry of reconciliation. I want to tell others, Jesus loves you. He died for your sin. If you'll trust Him, He'll save you. Simple as that. Be about the doctrine. And that's important too. We're just kind of walking our way through it. <coughs> Do you know you're saved? Spend more time studying, reading, getting the Word of God in you. Be busy about sharing the gospel of the grace of God with others. And then be busy about getting yourself more and more established in the doctrines of the Word of God. Knowing what we believe and why we believe it. It's an important thing. Churchianity at large out there has... Churchianity at large doesn't want to have anything to... You know. <laughs> of course, when I talk about Bible reading, I talk about King James Bible. I want you to get in your King James Bible. Uh, uh, when I talk about the gospel, I'm talking about the gospel of the grace of God, Paul's gospel that saves today. And then that kind of brings me to doctrine. People out there in churchianity today... You want to know how to build a big, big church? Don't just, just talk about the Word of God, but don't get real specific. It doesn't matter which one you use because they all... Yeah, it does matter which one you use. They're different. And things that are different aren't the same. But if you want to build a big church, don't make a big deal about the Bible. Which Bible is the Word of God? And if you want to build a big church, don't make a big deal out of what gospel. Just talk about Jesus and... You know, if they believe in Jesus and everybody who talks about Jesus is on their way to heaven. Folks, there's a whole lot of people that talk about Jesus. There's a whole lot of people sitting in church this morning going to die and bust tail wide open from a church pew. So we're not talking about just some general kind of thing. We're talking about specific things. That's why I talk about the doctrine. Know what you believe and why you believe it. Get in that book. Study that book. Know what that book says. I'm going to turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Most of it I'm just rushing through, but I am going to go over to 2 Timothy 4. And read this passage as we talk about this for just a moment. 2 Timothy 4. Of course, Paul's last letter. He's writing to Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead in his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Now folks, that's the modern church. That's the average church on the average street corner. Folks don't want to know about doctrine. Even folks who come and participate and gather with us here, they'll come and I'll, until I teach a doctrine that they don't like, and then they're gone. If I would keep very general and very specific, uh, we could keep a whole lot more people. Right? But when we start teaching doctrine, then it starts weeding folks out. But folks, doctrine is important. I could go on and on about doctrine. Paul had a great deal to say about doctrine. We need to know what we believe and why we believe it. And that's, that's why all, we... And say that's all a doctrine is. is know what you believe. Know what you believe and why you believe it. That's why it's doctrine. so important. That's why it's so important. Uh, what, what do you believe about heaven? What do you believe about hell? What do you believe about the gospel? What do you believe about the... What do you know about the earthly ministry of Christ and the ascended ministry of Christ? What do you know about rightly dividing the word of truth? I mean, all these things. Very simple stuff, some of it. Well, the eternal security of a believer. Do you think that's probably an important doctrine? Yeah. To know for sure that you're going to heaven when you die, not because of what you did, but because of what Jesus did? 
I mean, that's a pretty important doctrine. The inspiration and preservation of Scripture, that's a pretty important doctrine. Again, the gospel, not the kingdom gospel preached in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but the gospel of the grace of God preached by Paul. That's a pretty important doctrine. And knowing that those are two, two different gospels, that's a pretty important doctrine. We can go right on down the line. Know the doctrine. So we're talking about Bible reading. Knowing you're saved, studying and reading your Bible, being a faithful ambassador, understanding, learning doctrine. Brother Sam, I have to admit, I'm really ignorant about my Bible, but I want to I want to know more about my Bible. I want to understand doctrine. And I'm determined by the grace of God and with His help as I read and study my Bible that I'm going to learn more doctrine and get more grounded in what I believe and why I believe it in 2019. Folks, again, none of these things happen by accident. They all happen on purpose. They all happen on purpose. Prayer. Pray. <clears throat> we don't talk a whole lot about prayer. We, 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 we mention it. We pray before a service. We pray when we leave. And, and uh, you know, we pray in our life and as we go throughout the day. Of course, I've taught you that prayer is not just about a specific period of time that you set aside, but prayer is an attitude, a communication with God. You don't have to be in a quiet closet and spend an hour you know, every morning before you go out about your day. Uh, that's fine and wonderful if you do. Praise the Lord. But prayer and your prayer life is that awareness of the presence of God and that constant, consistent communication with the Lord. Pray. We ought to have a good, faithful prayer life. Praying for one another in this local assembly. Pray for folks that come and participate from time to time in this local assembly. Husbands praying for wives. Wives praying for husbands. Children praying for parents. Parents praying for the children. Church members praying for the pastor. Pastor praying for church members. Praying for one another. Really genuinely praying for one another. There's an old-fashioned concept. I haven't talked much about it. I think some of you do this. I used to do it years ago. I've gotten away from it. But you know, there's nothing wrong with real practical a prayer list. Actual written down prayer list. Nothing wrong with that. Now it can become religious and it becomes roped and it can become something just to check off another mark, but it doesn't have to be. Nothing wrong with it. I find myself, I need more and more reminders. I need more of them all the time. When I get ready for work in the evening, there should be something. I'll need to be sure and take something with me on a job or do something. And I've gotten a habit is I'll take a big piece of paper and a big a black you know, marker, and I'll mark, part, part of mark, put a mark on that on that piece of paper to remind me not to forget. You know why? Because I've gotten in my van and I've been halfway to Knoxville on my way to a job and remembered I needed to go by the shop and get this part for this job I'm halfway to now. Reminders. Well, now some of you younger people may not have to do that, but the older you get, the more you're going to find that useful. I have two medicines I take. I take meloxicam from arthritis and omeprazole for a little heartburn. I take them every morning and I set those two bottles at night right on the kitchen, on the bathroom sink. I set them there. You know why? Because if I don't, I'll forget to take them. And then once I take them, I put them back in the cabinet because if I don't, I'll come back through that bathroom 30 minutes later and I'll say, did I take my medicine this morning? See, reminders. So there's nothing wrong with a prayer list to remind you. Do a prayer list if you need to. Pray for, our, pray for each other as we pray and we know each other's burdens, concerns of life, and some we know, you know, some, I tell too much. Y'all know more about me than you should. Others of you, we know nothing about you. You keep everything real right. And that's all fine and good. But for what we do know about one another, pray for one another. Share each other's burdens. Care for one another. Be prayerful. Prayer for each other's ministries. Each one of us, again, have a ministry. We all have a place where we're effective. We all have a group of folks, a, a little sphere of influence where we're effective. Pray for one another's ministries. Pray for those individual ministries. Pray for the corporate ministries of the church. The things we do as a church body. We've got this Coggins Clinic coming up. Now, what in the world does a Coggins Clinic have to do with the ministry? But it's an opportunity for us to reach out to horse people and as they come through and they get those horses vaccinated and, and all that taken care of. We've got a ministry to the UT vets that come because some of them have been coming every year. We've got a ministry to them. 
We've got a ministry to all those folks that come through, and some of them come through every year. And we put a gospel track. We put something that will talk to them about the Lord, about the gospel, about the Word of God. We put something in their hand every year when they come. That's the ministry. So we pray about the, the corporate ministries that we do as a local body, as well as the individual ministries that we have. Praying for the lost. You have to be real careful nowadays about, you know, especially if you had a church prayer list about putting people's name down. But pray for the lost. You have lost people, lost family, lost friends, people you associate with. You know. Now, now, now listen, whether they're in church or not in church. Praying for the lost. Hear God. And then while you pray for them, look for an opportunity to share the gospel with them. Plant that seed. And then while you pray for me, pray for me as your pastor. And I don't know that, you know that I've ever made a point to say that, but pray for me. Pray that God would give me wisdom. Pray that God would give me leadership. Pray that God would move upon my heart and mind as I read and study, that I might be better prepared to learn and preach and present those things that y'all need as you come here each Sunday. Pray for me. Don't go to, like the preacher said on the radio this morning, don't go to the backside of Food City and reach each other now and talk about me. Right? Pray for me. And then if you've got an issue with me, come see me. Don't meet in the aisle at Food City. Or Facebook or wherever else you might be. Alright? Pray for me. Pray for the radio ministry. And, and pray for you know the other ministries that you know I'm involved in. Pray for me. Uh, giving. Can't get away from God. Not talking about giving, can we? But we're not just talking about finances, although that's a part of it. But we know that God says He loves a cheerful giver. Again, we don't give out of necessity because we have to, but we give out of a desire to support the ministry. And when I talk about giving, I'm not just talking about finances. I'm talking about, you know, those three T's that the preachers like to use when they talk about giving. I'm talking about your time. I'm talking about your talents. I'm talking about your treasures. Be willing to give. I think we talked about this, you know, a Sunday or two ago. If you can sing, come sing a song. If you can play an instrument, come play an instrument. Give. That's what you can do. Brother Sam, I'll never get behind this pulpit and, and teach a lesson. That's fine. But do what you do where you do it. Right? And be busy about that. If you can play an instrument or sing a song, then make a point. You know, I do know how to sing. I can carry a tune in a bucket. And, uh, you know, it's not too bad. And, uh, you know, I mean, when I sing, the cats don't howl, the dogs don't howl, and, you know, I, I can do this. I, I've not had anybody, you know, run me out of church house because they heard me singing or anything. You know, if you can sing a song, come sing a song. But your time and your talents and your treasure, all three of those things, and I'll not labor on that. I think you understand what I'm saying. Give it, Lord, Lord listen, Lord, as I go into 2019, uh, I want to take those things that I have within me and just who I am and I want to use those things to bring honor and glory to the Lord. I want to give those things to the ministry and give those things to the work of God. I want you to use me, Lord, in the place that you can use me. And as we've said so many times, each one of us is prepared and equipped to work and to minister in a place that others of us will never be able to work in ministry. I could call names, but there's circles that you could go to that you'll have an influence in that I'd never have an influence in, and vice versa. And I say the same, th same thing goes with kids. It's one thing when adults talk to kids, but it's another thing when kids talk to kids. Huh? It's another thing when kids talk to kids. I mean, preachers are supposed to preach, and moms and daddies are supposed to preach, and they're supposed to, you know, but... but when, when that other 12-year-old is talking to the other 12-year-old about the Lord and about the gospel and about what they know about the Word of God, do you think that might have an impact and influence far greater than you ever realize? Sure it does. Of course, when you're a little snot, that has an influence too. Right? And that goes for the adults too. You can't be a little snot, you know, and then try to talk to somebody about Jesus expect them to listen to you. Right? Oh me. Brother Sam, quit meddling and go back to preaching. Uh, uh, the local body. I'm, I'm, I'm heading to the end, I promise. The local body. We know that, that each individual who is saved is, is placed into the body of Christ. Amen? 
And we always say you don't go to church, just you are the church. This is not the house of God. This is where the house of God meets. We are the temple of God. He dwells and lives within us. We are the church. And so as we function in our ministries, we're about the, and what we're doing, we're functioning as members of the body of Christ. But there is that local assembly where we gather together and each of us are members one of another. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, go down through there. And 1 Corinthians 12 talks about us being members one of another. And here's what I want to say about this so that you understand. Every individual in this local assembly is a part of, that, of this assembly and you're needed and you're wanted and you have a ministry and a place here even if that ministry or place is just that you're there. Amen? Uh, uh, Dewey asked me about Norm. I'm missing seeing Norm sit back there this morning. And I'm mindful that Norm's hurting in the hospital. Norm comes in, he may not say three words, he sits there and he gets up and leaves, but he's a part of this body and I miss him when he's not here. I suspect you do too. We come in, we sit down, we look around and, and it's not, I don't know where they are this morning. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a burden and a concern and a love for one another. And we come together as a local assembly because we realize we are part of a local body of believers. And we come together for fellowship and for encouragement, for strength and for edification from the Word of God. That we might be better equipped and better prepared to go out and function as ambassadors for Christ in the world we live in. And then the last thing, and it all is summed up in this last word as we give the challenge. And it's the, it's, it's, it's the word love. Do all of it be done in love. I'm going to take you to Romans chapter 12, I think. Back to the left there a little bit. Romans chapter 12. I've got a bunch of verses. I'm going to do them all. But I'm going to go back to Romans chapter 12. I think it's where I'm going. I'm trying to be real conscious of my time. Lots of places we could go. Like I said, I've got a big long list. I've got more list of verses for love. You know, I do a, when I'm studying, I'll type in the word in my Bible app and I'll come up so many, how many references have that particular word. And uh, uh, I think uh, when I typed in the word love this morning, uh, I got more references to love than any of the other words I've looked up. I think it's used uh, 202 times in the New Testament alone. Uh, and that, that's not even considering the word charity, just the word itself, love. But in Romans 12, 9 and 10, let love be without dissimulation. And that's one of those big, long $10 words. It's a hiding under a false pretense. In other words, it's the idea of, of hypocrisy, right? Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another, to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. And all that comes back to, I mean, we can put everything else under that umbrella, couldn't we? In honor, preferring one another. Let love be without hypocrisy, without dissimulation, without hiding under a false appearance. Uh, turn over, look at the next page, chapter 13. The verses 8, 9, and 10. Chapter 13 of Romans, 8, 9, and 10. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Like I said, I've got several other references. I won't take time to go that far. But when I come back and I consider, and when we come back and consider first and foremost God's love for us, and then because of God's love for us, that should create within us a love for others, a love for the lost, that they might come to faith in Christ, a love for other believers, as members of the body of Christ, that's when I go back and I start asking those questions again. 
So I take that umbrella of love, and because of the love of Christ for me and for the lost and for others, that I want to go into 2019 determined. I want to, I want to know more about my Bible. I want to read my Bible more. I want to study my Bible more. I want to go into 2019. Because I love others, I, I want to be a better ambassador in 2019. I want to be about that ministry of reconciliation to a greater degree than I was last year. Because of that love for others, I know it's important. People are, people are, are starving. You know, church folks. I'm not even talking about lost folks. Church folks are sitting in church pews. They're starving to death. They're being, fellow, they're being fed shallow devotional sermons, and they're starving to death for any real meat and doctrine. Well, what greater way to love someone else who you know is starving to death than to try to put something out there to feed them. Now listen, you don't force feed. Right? You can't force feed it, just, but you've got to be putting it out there. Why? Because you love them. Well, you can't put it out there if you don't have it. Get the doctrine in you. Pray it. Because of love, I want to pray. I want to pray for my wife, for my husband, for, for the members of our local assembly. I want to pray for the lost. I want to pray for our ministries. I want to pray for our pastor. I want to pray for the church. All that beloved. Because of love, I want, I, want to be, I want to support the ministry with my time, talent, and treasure more this year than I did last year. I want to be appreciative and, 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 and a member and function within the local body to a greater degree in 2019 that I did in 2018. All that comes together. So there's our challenge as we finish up this year and enter into the new year. Stop and consider those things. Now again, somebody can come up and say, well, Brother Sam, you didn't mention this. Well, if I had mentioned that, we'd have been here another 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> Brother Sam, you didn't mention that. Okay, well, there's another 10, 15 minutes. And the next thing you know, we've got a series. And this is the last Sunday of the year, and this is what we did. Now, let me say this right before we dismiss. I, I post uh, daily Bible readings on Facebook and and uh, if you're challenged, I challenge folks to read their Bible through in a year. I uh, always challenge folks to do that. It's just good to do that. Uh, if you use the Wonder Bible, that make that real easy. I'm going to be working on a list that I can put in your hand that you can use as a guide. If just on a practical way, if you start in Genesis on January 1st and you read three chapters a day every day, you will read your Bible through in a year. And so that's a simple way to do that. You don't have to have a list. Just three chapters a day. Uh, but I am working on a list, and, and there will be a particular order that will have that, and I'll make that available hopefully by next Sunday. But uh, if you're interested and want to do that, and then I put the first week right up here. So you can come and take a picture of that, and that will guide you because you're going to read Genesis 1 through 11, and then you're going to start in the book of Job, and, uh, and we'll go from there. But uh, just wanted to put that out there. It's there if you want it to get yourself started because the new year will be upon us. And one thing I've learned, if you're going to start reading your Bible through, uh, you want to get started on January 1st. You don't want to come in here on the 4th or the 5th and try to catch up. Because guess what? You never catch up. Life gets in the way. So there's the challenge. All right. Any final word before we have a word of prayer to sing our final song? Appreciate your patience with me. Appreciate everybody being here. Appreciate our guests. I want everyone to come back and be a part of us. We're here. So we don't. We don't. We, we just. We don't do a church role. You just come and identify with us. Like I said, if you're if you're a saved member of the body of Christ, you're a part of us, whether we like it or not. And uh, so come be with us. All right. And uh, and the more often you come to be with us, the more we expect to see. You. All right. Very good. <coughs> All right, uh, brother Aaron, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer?